So the first thing I do, uh, Matthew and Caroline, is the first thing I do is we do a verse of the day. So go ahead and take a break from filling that out for just a minute. And let's look at the verse of the day. I, I, and what I do is I review the verses that we did last week, and then we'll do a verse for today. So do you all, all remember this? And if Christ, Christ has not been risen. risen or raised, then our not prayer, it's a good guess, but it's preaching in this case. Yeah, preaching, our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. That means we might as well quit and go home. If he's not raised from the dead, there's no point in us doing this, because that's, uh, none of it's real. He's, he has been raised from the dead, and God has seen fit to give us lots of evidence that Jesus really has risen, risen from the dead. So we talk about that in a Warriors of Christ class a lot, but uh, sometimes I'll talk about it. We talked about it last week a little bit. Then this from 1 Corinthians 15. Do not be deceived. Some kind of company. Um, hanging out with the wrong people. Bad company does what? To good morals. What? Corrupt. Very good. Corrupt. Do you remember the R word? Ruins. Very good. I'm impressed. Very good memory. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals or corrupts good morals. In other words, you hang out with the wrong people, they're going to lead you to make bad decisions. You're going to find yourself doing things you didn't think you would do because you're hanging out with people who are willing to kind of lead the way. They'll do things. So I, one of the things I always encourage Christian kids to do is think very carefully about who is influencing who. When you hang out with other people, they're either influencing you to do some things you will, may regret later on or maybe you're influencing them. But if you as a Christian, you try to talk to non-Christians about the Bible or about the Lord or about what's right and what's wrong, uh, if they just roll their eyes at you and say, oh, you're an old fuddy-duddy, you know, I don't want to hang out with you, uh, you're probably hanging out with the wrong people, you know. So uh, that's what God's talking about there. Bad company can mess up your life. Here's today's verse, and uh, it's from Joshua. Let me give you the background here, and then we'll look at this verse. This, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And I'll tell you more about it once we say it. But uh, you remember how the nation of Israel came about? God called a man named Abraham. And he said, I'm going to make a nation out of your people. And, and he was too old to have kids. But he, he, I'm, I'm going I'm to have to shorten this some. I'll go too much. But we talked about Abraham in here, if you remember. Uh, you might not have been in Gabe. I don't know. But, but Abraham uh, was, was a man of faith. He believed God. God counted it to him as righteousness. He, 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 that's what God's trying to teach us. We need to learn how to trust him. And he said, I'm going to give you a son. And the son turned out to be Isaac. He was born later on. Both Abraham and Sarah were very old. And he said, through Isaac, you're going to have a, a, a nation's going to be come, coming out. Are you trying to get, are you just stretching or yes me? Okay, okay. So then Isaac had a son named, two sons, Jacob and Esau. But Jacob was the son that God said, I'm going to, give you this promise through and God changed Jacob's name to Israel so that was his name of the man Israel Jacob had 12 sons and they became the 12 tribes of Israel that's how the nation of Israel came about one of the sons name was Joseph and his brothers hated him and they sold him into slavery down in, in Egypt and he wound up because he could interpret dreams because God's hand was on him he wound up rising to the second in command in Egypt he was second to Pharaoh and he's the one that God used to prepare Egypt for a famine and so the famine came, and they had plenty of food because God had used Jacob to prepare them. So then, after that, uh, Jacob's family, Joseph's family, that they thought were, they thought, his dad thought he was dead, uh, his family came down to Egypt after that, finally all together. It's a long story, but the whole last part of Genesis talks about this. And, they, and they, they're given a place there in Goshen where the Nile River comes up to the Mediterranean Sea. It's a very fertile place. They, let, they live there in that Nile Delta and they were able to, God supernaturally caused them to have lots of kids. I mean, they, they, they were, their families were big, and they had lots and lots of kids and, and, and descendants until they grew into a nation that was so big that God said, now I'm going to take you out of Egypt. And that's when he raised up Moses to take them out of Egypt. So Moses led them out of Egypt. You remember that God told Pharaoh to let the people go, and he didn't want to because he was using them as slaves. And and God caused the Nile to turn to blood, and, and, and he caused lots of other plagues to come. And finally, the death of the firstborn children, for anybody who wasn't trusting God or didn't have the blood over their doors, uh, was the final plague. And when that happened, God, Pharaoh finally said, look, go on, just get out of here. And God took them with Moses leading them 
about several million people actually, and they, they left Egypt and they went across the Red Sea. Remember, the God divided the Red Sea so they could get through, and Pharaoh, they came back in and drowned Pharaoh's army. And then they wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years after that. Moses led them that whole time. He was the great leader, greatest leader they'd ever had. And a lot of Jews would look back to him as the greatest leader they ever would have. Uh, that's debatable, but, but anyway. But God said, you can't go in, Moses. You can't go into the promised land. Uh, he, after that 40 years of leading him through the wilderness, God said, you're going to have to die outside the promised land. So Moses died on the east side of the Jordan River. And then uh, God said, now, Joshua, it's your turn. You're going to be the leader now. So Joshua was now in charge of his people. And Joshua was terrified because he thought, who am I? to lead this great nation. I mean, millions of people, I, I don't know how to do it. Plus, they were going into a land. It wasn't just like going in and, and it's all ready for them to just sit down and, and enjoy life. They had to fight. They, they were, there were enemies of God in that land that had set themselves up against God, had depraved people. They would even sacrifice their kids to false gods and stuff like that. And God said, I want those people driven out. I don't want them to stay there. That land's going to be your land. So they had to do that, and Joshua had to lead them. God, of course, was in charge of the whole thing. But when Joshua was worried and anxious about it, God gave this word to him of encouragement, and he wrote it down in his books in Joshua chapter 1 in the Bible. And he wrote it down so that we would have this verse for ourselves because we need it too, just like Joshua needed it. And I don't know if any of you have memorized it or not, but if you haven't, it would be a good one to memorize. So God says this to Joshua, Have not I commanded thee? Now, that's King James English. You know, we'd say, haven't I told you, Joshua? Haven't I commanded you this already? And here's the command. Be something and of a good something. Do you know? You want to guess what that is? Joshua's terrified. He's scared. And God says, you need to be strong. strong. Very good. Now, I'm going to say a word about that. God knows that we can't be strong ourselves. We're weak. All of us are. And so he, when he tells us to be strong, he wants us to do it by trusting him. There's a verse in Ephesians that says, uh, Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. So we have to be strong in him. I can't be strong in myself. I'm, I'm no good at it. I'm, I'm too weak. So is everybody else. So he says, Be strong, but he means be strong in me, Joshua. That's, and, and he's going to explain that. Be strong and of a good Good something. This is a word that's kind of a synonym for brave. Courage. Yeah, courage. Yeah. Of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage, which basically means courageous. Or some translations translate it courageous. Be strong and courageous, which means brave. Be not. Brave. Yeah, good. Be not afraid. And then neither be. This is a little less common word, but it rhymes with afraid. It sounds like afraid, only it's a different word. It means discouraged or depressed, or feeling overwhelmed. That's, that's a good guess, but that's not it. It does start with a D-I-S. The, th the next letter, the fourth letter is an M. Remember I said it rhymes with afraid. Dis if you're really discouraged, and you really say, oh, nothing's working out. What? Not discouraged, that's a good guess too, but that's not it. Be, be not it, it kind of means the same thing as discouraged only it's like just kind of giving up just oh no everything's awful uh, be not afraid neither be D-I-S-M and it rhymes with afraid rhymes you know what rhymes means right it means the same sounds the same Dis, dismayed dismayed mm -hmm. you know familiar with that word dismayed dismay uh, you may, maybe a new word to you dismayed oh it's kind of like discouraged it's like oh no everything's going wrong this is awful i'm dismayed you know so do not afraid neither be dismayed dismayed and this is why for the who lord, lord your god is something you in other words god said i'm not going anywhere what Watch. watching is a good guess but that's not it it's a little simpler than that he said i'm not going anywhere what Waiting is a good guess too, but that's not the word. With. with. With is the word. For the Lord your God is with you. Can you finish it? Joshua's not going to stay. Where, where he's got to move out. Going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, go. 
How about this? Where? Wherever. Mm -hmm. Wherever you go. Now, that's King James, so I, I, I should have had another translation up here, but I learned it originally in King James. But I change it kind of to more modern English. So I'll, I'll say it like this. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed. I don't usually say that word because we don't do it in modern English. But he's talking to Joshua or us. For the Lord your God is with you wherever, instead of whithersoever, that's a King James word, wherever you go. We don't say goest anymore. We, this is wherever you go. So, have not I commanded you, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to say just a little bit more about this verse. I told you probably, maybe, uh, that when I was a very young man, I struggled a lot with anxiety and fear and worry and depression and discouragement. I really struggled with that. And somebody suggested I need to memorize some verses like this. And this is one of them I memorized. Several others like this one. There's several verses that God gives us for times like that to deal with fear and anxiety and stuff, worry. And so I memorized it. And it began to become a really, really important part of my life. Now, that was when I was a young man. I, and it's been a part of my life for many, many years now. Several years ago, let's see if I can figure out when this was, 2000, a few years ago from now, let's see, I'm going to say about 2009, Gabe, am I losing you? Uh, uh, 2009, my wife and I, when, when we were first married back in the 1980s, uh, I had three sons and she had four sons. So altogether we have seven sons. One of them has died now. But one of our sons, his name was Jeremy, he's the one that's dead, had some real, made some really bad decisions when he got to be an adult. But he, he married a woman. I say married. They never get a marriage license, but they made a commitment to God in my presence, theoretically anyway, that they were, they were ending in a marriage covenant. And they lived together, and they had two children. One was a girl named Kaylee, and the other boy named Austin. And we love those grandchildren to death. And Jeremy made some really bad decisions. So around 2009, he had made some bad decisions. And he couldn't take care of his kids. And their mom didn't want him to live with her. So my wife and I said, you can come live with us. So we took those two kids here to Tennessee. They, they were in Texas. That's where they were raised. That's where they are now. So, uh, so they came to live with us. And, and it was a really difficult year in some ways for my wife and me because we're old <laughs> but but it was wonderful because we love these kids and one of the verses I taught them I had them memorize several verses and one of them was this one in fact I've got a video of uh, Kaylee quoting this verse when she was about seven years old it's on YouTube um, and I, of course I talked with them about what it meant I said you know there are going to be times in your life when things are not going well for you things are difficult they, they, they had already experienced some of that even as little bitty kids but God's promising you that he will, he will be with you wherever you go. And you don't have to be worried. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be dismayed. You can be strong. You can be of good courage because God's going to be with you. 2015, we, we of course, stayed up as close as we could with, with Jeremy, our son, through the years. We talked with him on the phone. And he, would, he was the kind of kid that would say what we wanted to hear. He knew what we wanted to hear. And we thought things were better than they really were. He was making some really bad decisions. We knew he'd had a problem with alcohol, but we thought he'd quit drinking. He told us he had, but he really hadn't. So he wound up getting involved with a group. Of, this, this was a good thing, probably. There was, some, there was a motorcycle club made up of, of uh, first responders, police, firemen, those kind of guys who, died, who rode motorcycles. And they would, they would do good things for kids and stuff like that. It was a really kind of interesting club. They'd travel all over the country. And he got involved with them, and, and they had a chaplain. And we found out from that chaplain later that he didn't realize Jeremy had kept drinking also, but now he did. And J Jeremy was having a medical problem at one point, and the chaplain took him to the hospital. And by that time, it was too late. Jeremy had waited too long. He had drunk him, basically drunk himself to death, giving himself cirrhosis of the liver, and, and he died. Uh, at that point, uh, we had a funeral for him. We, you know, they called us from Texas and said he's near death. And we got down there before he died. He told us he'd made a commitment to Christ. Only God knows his heart. But we had a funeral. And the chaplain of the motorcycle club 
was the one who gave the main message if you know we asked him to do that but I said I want to say a few words too and what I did is I looked to Kaylee and Austin at that point they were probably aged like 12 or 13 and, and maybe 10 or 11 that, 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 that was their ages and I, and I reminded them this verse that they'd memorized when they lived with us and I said there are going to be times when you're going to be lying in your bed at night crying because they still lived with their dad uh, and they, they wound up moving in with their mom at this point uh, that was there were goods and bad things about that. But anyway, I said, you're going to be wondering, why, Lord? Why did you let this happen? And I said, you need to cling to this verse and other verses like it because God's not going to leave you. God's going to be there with you in the middle of the night when you're crying in bed, whatever. He's going to be there, and he's not going to leave you no matter what. So you can be strong. You can be of a good courage. You can get through this and every other difficult experience in life because he's not going to leave you. you know? And so they, I encourage them to quote that verse a lot. So it's a pretty powerful verse, and it's been a powerful verse for me many, many times. And I just encourage you to memorize it and uh, get it in your heart and mind and memorize it well enough so you'll have it when you need it, when things are going badly. So let's see if we can start memorizing it now. Have not I commanded you. That's how it starts. Have not I commanded that you. Have not I commanded you. Have not I commanded you. Be strong. Be strong. That's the first command. And of a good courage, or you just want to, you can say courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. Now, I remember that easily because they rhyme. Afraid and dismayed sound alike. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. You can't get away from him. Wherever you go, he's with you. So let's see if you can remember some of it. Can you remember how it starts? Have not I commanded you? Be strong and have a good courage. Do not be afraid. Neither be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Very good. Some of you just about got it already. Awesome. Anything you want to say, add, talk about, ask, for, or want me to pray about? Anything? Okay. Well, Father, thank you so much for this verse. Thank you for putting it in your word. Thank you for using it to encourage your man Joshua when he gave him this huge, enormous task before him. And thank you, Lord, that by causing him to write it down in your word, we also can have this verse when we need it. And, Lord, we need it a lot because it seems like there are many, many times when things don't go well, things don't go our way, and we're struggling. And, Lord, we thank you that when that happens, we can remember this verse that, that you've commanded us to, to be strong, not in ourselves, but in you. And we can be courageous. We can be of a good courage. Again, not in ourselves, but because you're in us and we're in you when we're trusting Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be afraid and we don't have to be dismayed or downcast or discouraged or fearful or worried or anxious. Because, Lord, you, you said, you, our Lord, our God, you're with us wherever we go. You'll be there ahead of us. You'll be there with us. You're never, you're never going to leave us. So, Lord, thank you for that assurance. And I pray that we will be found faithful to memorize words like these that you've given us in other verses so that we can be strong in you and we can be courageous in you and we can get rid of fear because of you and get rid of dismay because of you. So, Lord, help these kids to learn these verses really, really well. Well, thank you. I, I know you don't make mistakes, and I know even when we wonder sometimes why we're doing what we're doing or where we are we know that ultimately you engineered all this for your purposes and i thank you for matthew and for caroline for bringing them into our class and lord i know that you've got a purpose in that and i pray that they will grow stronger in you with the rest of us as we read your word and think about your plan and your purpose and what you've done through the men and women that you've told us about in your word so thank you for this time thank you for what you're going to teach us today and thank you again for this wonderful verse in jesus name amen all right, now, uh, Matthew and Carolyn, you can go ahead and fill out your forms now if you want to. And I'm going to go ahead and, and just kind of kind of multitask if you can. Kind of pay attention to me and do the forms at the same time. Um, let's see where we got to. Uh, let's see. So we were talking earlier about Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, 
Israel. And uh, when we left off talking about him, he had been taken down to Egypt. You remember he was, he was his brothers were going to kill him. They hated him because he, he was, he, he probably was kind of an obnoxious kid. <laughs> you know, I mean, God had a plan for him. And he was going to use him. But he had these dreams. And in the dreams, his family was bowing down to him. <laughs> Now, God was showing what was going to happen because one day he was going to be the second in command of Pharaoh in Egypt and his family would come and need. He was going to take care of them and they needed him. <laughs> but at the time, his brothers just thought, you arrogant little jerk. <laughs> he was the youngest kid. Benjamin, his younger brother, would be born later. Uh, so he did have a younger brother, but he had not met him when they took him down to Egypt. <laughs> so he, they sold him into slavery. A man named Potiphar bought him. He was an important man in Pharaoh's army, guard. guard. And, uh, and you remember uh, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph and tried to get to have sex with her, and he just ran and fled. And, but, but then she accused him of trying to rape her, so they arrested him and put him into a, 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 an Egyptian prison. And you may remember that probably that, uh, that uh, Potiphar's wife knew, Potiphar knew that his wife couldn't be depended on, otherwise he'd probably just have killed Joseph. He had the power to kill Joseph, and he didn't do it. He just put him in prison. So that probably kept his wife happy, but also kind of took care of Joseph because he probably knew Joseph well enough to know he was innocent. Remember, he'd given Joseph responsibility for his whole, he'd turned his whole household and his whole ranch and everything he owned over to Joseph to take care of, to manage it. So anyway, while he was there, uh, uh, the captain of Pharaoh's guard uh, appointed Joseph to be responsible for two of, of Pharaoh's men, one of his cupbearer, the one that uh, tasted the wine before Pharaoh did to make sure it wasn't poisoned and, and served the wine and everything, took care of that. And then the baker, who of course baked all his baked goods, his bread and everything, both those guys wound up getting in trouble and wound up going to prison where Joseph was. And while they were there, they had dreams. Now remember, God's behind all of this. God's, we call this the, uh, well, the word just left my brain. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call, what do you call it when God kind of works all the details out behind the scenes? God's providence, the providence of God. This is the God, providence of God is happening here, and uh, and and they have dreams that God calls them to have. Each had his own dream with his own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw they were troubled, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, "Why are your faces downcast today?" And they said to him, "We've had dreams." So they've had some, obviously some really vivid dreams and it's sticking with them. And this, there's got to be some significance to this. And there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretation belong to God. Tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me. Remember, he's the one that kind of took care of the wine. Now my clicker's not working again. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So he had that dream, and it troubled him. Then Joseph said to him, This is his interpretation. The three branches are three days. How did he know that? Because God just revealed it to him. That's all way he can explain that. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you'll place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. So, so you're going to Pharaoh's going to take you back and put you right back where you were. Your job's going to continue. But he said, "Listen, remember me when it's well with you. Please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this place." He's in this prison. Joseph doesn't deserve to be in prison. Joseph knew he was innocent. He'd been thrown in prison because Pharaoh, because a part of his wife accused him of rape when he was totally innocent. So Pharaoh knew. I mean, Joseph knew he didn't didn't need to be in prison. But God had a plan. God had a purpose. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. So he's like a slave. And he's stolen and sold as a slave. And now he's in this prison. And he said, I've done nothing to, to deserve to be here. All right. That was with the, the cupbearer. Then the, the baker had been watching and listening to all this. The chief baker. And he saw that, well, the first guy turned out pretty good. So he said, I had a dream too. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. He's going to cut your head off. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. So that's a pretty horrible thing. 
On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. So the, the, the Pharaoh did what exactly Joseph said would happen. So Joseph had interpreted the dreams correctly. But the, and, the, and of course now the, the baker's dead, but the cupbearer is alive serving Pharaoh. But he didn't mention he didn't mention Joseph. What did they do, Mr. Paul? We don't know. We, you, what did they do wrong that Pharaoh got upset with them? We don't know. The Bible didn't tell us. It just says Pharaoh got angry with him and put him in prison. So who knows? We, I mean, all you, have to, all you could do is guess. He may have thought that they were, you know, sometimes when somebody's in charge, that some of the men around him get sick of him and they want somebody else to be in charge, so they start working to overthrow him. He may have thought they were doing something like that. But evidently he changed his mind about the cupbearer and said, no, I, I think you're innocent. But he didn't change his mind about the baker and he's had him put to death. But that's just a guess. We just don't know. But that's a good question. Thanks for asking. Makes me happy when you ask questions. It really does, Gabe. Thank you. I'm glad you're in here. Keep, keep, keep asking. So, I'll tell you another thing, an interesting thing. This is just kind of a joke kind of thing. But there are two birthdays mentioned in the Bible. One of them was Pharaoh's birthday right here. And the other was Herod's birthday in the New Testament. On Herod's birthday, you remember what happened? Uh, the, Herod's wife... He had taken a wife that didn't belong to him. It, it, his sister's, it, it, it should have been his sister-in-law. She was married to his brother. But he took her for his own wife. And she had a daughter that was a very beautiful young girl. And so on his birthday, the girl danced for him, danced for Herod. And, and, he, and he loved it. He was kind of drunk, you know, and he loved to dance. And he said, I tell you what, he said, ask whatever you want. I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom. And... Uh, and she ran to her mother and said, what should I ask? And she said, ask him for the head of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had told him it was wrong for him to be married to this woman. So John the Baptist, they, they thought, was an irritant. John the Baptist, by the way, was very, very famous in that day. He was, thousands of people came out to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. A lot of people came to hear him preach. He was like a great prophet, the last of the great prophets before Jesus came. But, they, but, but she asked for John's head, and he thought, well, I'm, he didn't want to kill John because he knew John was a man of God. But he also didn't want to look bad. So because he cared about what people thought and she had asked him for John's head, he thought, i got to do it. So he had, had John's head cut off. And on Pharaoh's birthday, he had the baker's head cut off. When it says he hanged him, when we think of hanging, we think of a rope hanging from a tree or something. But what they usually did in that day when they hanged him, they would nail their bodies up on a tree or, or tie them up on a tree uh, after they were already dead. And he, he cut off his head and he put his body up there. It's pretty awful. But, the, so, so the dreams came out exactly like Joseph said they would, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, well, they, uh, the, the, like I said, the, the baker's dead, but the cupbearer would not remind Pharaoh of what Joseph had done. Maybe he was a little afraid to. He thought, yeah, I better keep quiet. <laughs> you know, he's got me back here. I got my job back. I'm just going to kind of lay low. I don't want to stir up things. But eventually he gets convicted, and this, and this is what happens. After two whole years, so Pharaoh's down there in that prison two more years, and it's like, I mean, Joseph is down there in that prison. It's almost like, Lord, where are you? Why are you letting this happen to me? I don't understand. You know, why am I going through this? God had a plan. Just remember that when you're going through a rough time. I mean, nobody went through much of a rougher time than Joseph did, but God had a plan. So after two years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass, seven fat cows. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. So now he's got this sense of, whoa, this means something significant. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. So, so he's had two dreams now. And they both are very similar. Something fat followed by something skinny. And the skinny thing eats up the fat thing. <coughs> and, and, and he is troubled. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none. There were none who 
could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, oh, he, he sees this, and he's having deja vu. He thinks, oh my. Pharaoh's had some dreams. They're very powerful. They're, he knows they're very significant. I had a dream. So did the, cup, uh, the baker. We had dreams. They seemed very powerful, very significant. And God allowed Joseph to interpret my dream, and he was exactly right. And God allowed Joseph to interpret the baker's dream, and he was exactly right. <coughs> and I told Joseph that I'd remind Pharaoh of him, speak favorably of him to Pharaoh, and I haven't done it. So he now, he's convinced, it's been two years, it's on the other screen, but he's convinced now that, okay, Pharaoh's probably not going to kill me. He's going to let me go off, and maybe I can help in this situation. I remember my offenses. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in the chief baker in custody, the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew, he's talking about Joseph, was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream, and as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office. The baker was hanged, just like Joseph said. So he tells all that to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, i got to talk to this guy because maybe he can help me. So Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit, the prison. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he wanted to be, they wanted him to be presentable to Pharaoh. He came in before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So he's saying, it's not me, Pharaoh. He's, he, Joseph's doing exactly the right thing. We can learn from this. There'll be times in your life when people will brag on you. Maybe you'll do something in church or you'll do something at school and somebody says, you did good. Well, be thankful for that. You know, that's encouragement. And when I like to hear those words myself. But I remind myself when somebody tells me I did good, I remind myself and the Lord, Lord, you and I both know it's not me. It's you. You did good. You just happened to use me. <laughs> so give him the glory. Because when you give him the glory, because it really is him. If, if something good's happening in your life, God's working. And when God's working and you give him the glory, you'll find yourself enjoying the joy of the Lord and the peace of God and the, and the purpose that God put you here for. And it's good. And, you'll, and it'll, it'll bless you. And it'll also be just telling the truth. This is God, not me. That's what Joseph did. He just told Pharaoh the truth. It's not me, Pharaoh. I don't have that ability. God does. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold in my dream, and so he tells him the dreams. I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I'd never seen in all the land of Egypt. Our cows have all been fat that I've seen. These, these are thin, ugly cows. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. So he's just telling him the dream. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. They were still thin. Then I woke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, tells him the second dream, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, just like the thin cows ate the fat cows. And I told the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, God reveals immediately to Joseph what's, what, what this is all about. He says, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. They got one meaning. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are the same. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty years bided by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. So he said, this is from God. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them will be arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. Because it, it, there'll be seven really great years, of lots of food, lots of great harvest, lots of wheat, and then comes the famine, and, and, the, and the, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to have anything grow. The famine will consume the land. The plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow. They'll forget how good those first seven years were because it's going to be so bad. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. God will shortly bring it about. When he says the doubling, he means he had the dream twice. Once about the cows and once about the years of corn. God does that in his word. When he wants to underline something or emphasize something, he'll often say it twice. He'll repeat himself. And it's his way of underlining it. Saying, this is, you better pay attention. So, now God's told 
Joseph what the dream is and dream, what the dream means. And Joseph's told Pharaoh what the dreams mean. And he's given glory to God. He said, God's doing all of this. So he said, now what you need to do, Pharaoh, is select a discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. So he's saying, you need to get prepared for the seven bad years. So, so when you've so you got seven really, really good years, you can eat a lot of that. Of course, you'll have to eat it to, to survive. But he said, some of it you need to set aside. He's, he recommended a fifth of it to set aside so that when the seven lean years came, they would have food that had stored up in the granaries and they could pass it out and people could have something to eat. So, he said, that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that will occur. When the seven bad years come, you'll already have some food set aside. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh's got this sense inside him that this guy knows what he's talking about. He really has heard from God. He believes him. And then he says to his servants, can we find a man like this? He's talking about Joseph. In whom is the Spirit of God? He could discern that God was working through Joseph. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there's none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people and shall order themselves as you command. You'll tell them what to do. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. So he said, I'm not making you greater than me. I'm still Pharaoh. I'm still in charge. But you're second in command, Joseph. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over the, over the land of Egypt. Now remember, when, when, Pharaoh, when, when Josephus, when, when Joseph, I'm going to lose you, Gabe. When Joseph came to, to Potiphar and they sold him to Potiphar, Joseph had so clearly was walking with God that Potiphar said, I can trust this guy. Joseph made it clear he could be trusted. He was an honest guy. And what did Potiphar do? He said, I'm going to put you in charge. You're in charge of all my property. Everything I have, it's, it's in your, you, you make the decisions. Of course, you're under me. I'm in charge of my land ultimately. I'm in charge of my family, my home, and my, my plantation or whatever, you know. But he said, under me, you're in, you're in charge of everything. And then, of course, he wound up in prison. And what happened? The prison guards said, did, said the same thing. He said, this guy's different. This guy has God in him. And this guy I can trust. And this guy has a lot of common sense. I can put him in charge of this prison. So he did. Under the, under the chief prisoner warden, he put Joseph in charge. And now Joseph is up here. And Pharaoh sees exactly the same thing. Only now it's the whole land of Egypt. He says, I can trust this guy. This guy's got God in him. He can see it. He can, he can see there's something different. He said, this guy's the one, he's the one that's got the wisdom of the God. So I'm going to let him take charge. And, and, and he just puts it all under Joseph's hand. So he says, you'll be over my whole house. All my people shall order themselves as you command. You, you're going to tell them what to do, and they'll have to do it. Owners will guard the throne, so I'll be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I've set you over, over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, Put it on Joseph's hand. That's how you, that was a signature, like, a, like giving him a signature to sign for things. And clothed him in garments of fine linen, best clothing they had. Put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. Pharaoh kept his first one. They called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. So now all of a sudden, Joseph's in an incredible place. And he now began to see what God was doing through all this time. God had a providence, a purpose. God had a reason. All this bad stuff is going to turn out good because Joseph kept his focus on God. He said, I'm going to do this your way, God. I want you to be in charge of me. And God raised him up. Seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands, not just in Egypt. It was everywhere. But in Egypt, there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. <laughs> He's the one that set this plan up. Well, he'll tell you what to do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold the grain to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. That means all the nations right around Egypt, including Israel, the people that lived there, his, his, you know, in the, in the place that would later be Israel. Because the famine was severe over all the earth, everywhere. It was, uh, it was a famine. When Jacob, that's Joseph's dad, learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? 
He said, Behold, I've heard there's grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy some grain for us. we got to eat. We're going to die. We don't have anything here. So buy some grain. So ten of Joseph's brothers went out to buy grain in Egypt. Those are the same ten that sold him into slavery. And now they're coming down here to buy grain from him. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. You remember, this is a lot, of, a lot of really ugly stuff here and sad things. This is true in most all families, but in Bible families it was certainly true. You remember Jacob wanted, he fell in love with Rachel. She was the one he wanted to be his wife. And then on the night of their wedding, because they wore a veil and he couldn't see them, and that night, Rachel's dad gave him Leah, her older sister, instead of Rachel. And he wound up marrying Leah. And then Joseph realized, I married, I, this isn't what I wanted. I wanted Rachel. And, and, the, and the dad, Laban, said, look, you can have Rachel too. He'd worked seven years for Rachel. And, and he said, but, but it's our custom to give the oldest girl first. She has to be married. So you've got to have them both. If you're going to take one, you've got to take both. And if you work seven more years for me, you can have them both. So Jacob agreed to do that, and now he had Rachel and Leah. And he didn't really love Leah, but she was his wife. And he provided for her, but he, he didn't really love her. And he had sex with her because she was his wife. You know, back then they had more than one woman. They're, obviously, it's not God's ideal plan. It wasn't God's, God didn't intend for it to be that way. Zach. Zach, you got to leave me? I'm sorry. Okay, we're going to miss the last few good minutes, but I'll pick this up next time where we're loading out right now. You won't miss much. We're about to stop. You have a good evening. See you Thursday. Um, anyway, um, so um, trying to decide how much farther to go here. <laughs> so Jacob wound up with four wives, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilhah. Bilhah and Zilhah had been servants of of Rachel and Leah. This was not God's ideal plan. I think sometimes he allowed it in the Old Testament days, especially because women were in such a bad situation. They couldn't provide for themselves. They couldn't, uh, if they didn't have a father to take care of them, they needed somebody to take care of them, and a husband would sometimes marry more than one. A lot of the men were killed in battle and those kind of things. So God may have allowed it for that reason to take care of some of the women to make sure they were taken care of. It wasn't ideal, though, and Jacob obviously loved Rachel more than the others. But Rachel was the one who couldn't have children. So he wound up having children by all of them except Rachel. And then finally God gave Rachel a son, Joseph, and another son, Benjamin. Now Jacob thinks he's lost Joseph. And he thinks, I'm, I'm going to lose Benjamin if he goes. I don't want to lose Benjamin. Because they were the children of his, the wife that he really loved. Sad. It's old thing sad. But God works a purpose out of it even when we mess up. He does that over and over again. So we'll pick this up next time. We need to stop. Anybody who need anything, need to say anything? Thank you all for being so attentive. I know it's sometimes hard to be attentive when it's late and you're tired and, and maybe it's a little too warm in here. I may have turned it up too much. It got cold earlier. But uh, I'm sorry. Help me get the temperature. If it gets too warm, let me know and I'll turn it back down. But, uh, but I appreciate the way you guys have been paying attention. Um, Matthew and Caroline, did you fill out forms out for me? Got them finished? Yeah. Okay. Just, just make sure you leave them here. I'll get them just a minute. Okay. Anything else? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for their attentiveness. Lord, thank you that they're listening to your word. And Lord, we look at your word and we realize there are a lot of things we don't understand. But we knew, know one thing and that's you have a plan and you work it out. And if we will keep our focus on you and trust you and trust our Lord Jesus Christ, you will work out your plan in our lives and it'll be good. Lord, we know if we do it ourselves and make our own decisions, we'll mess up just about every time. And we'll have so many regrets and so much pain. Lord, you didn't promise that life would be easy for us. But you did say that if we trust you, you'd bring us through every difficulty. And, and you'd bring us through well. And we'd look back with joy. And so we thank you that you're in charge. We want you to be in charge. So be in charge of us today. Help us to bless you this evening and all this week. And bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.